All right. Hi, everyone. My name is PK, and here I have actually very grateful to have um, Jared Gracious. He is a keen property investor, and I'm really going to be leveraging his experience and skill in today talking about Phil Anderson's 18.6 year property cycle. You might have heard about this property cycle. It's a US phenomenon and he's kind of translated it's Phil Anderson, an economist that is, into the Australian market. A lot of people talk about it. A lot of people talk about it accurately. A lot of people talk about it not accurately. Where are we on the cycle? Does it even have relevance in Australia? If we're at a good part of the cycle, does that mean we should just all be buying property or are we at a good part of the cycle, but it's about to finish as, you know, is the tide about to, to move away from the shore? Should we all be selling our property? These are the types of things that I requested Jared to, to come on and share. And so I'm really grateful, um, Jared, for, for you making the time. Thanks, PK. Looking forward to a chat, mate. Awesome. Awesome. So let's just get started. And I, I must confess, you know, I'm not as knowledgeable in this as I should be. So I'll be learning as I ask questions as well. And one thing that I'm really grateful for, Jared, and, and everyone who's watching as well, um, that Jared has an engineering background. So he's super number savvy, data savvy, um, you know, so it's really good to talk to people who are not just like have a perspective on real estate but have an educated perspective on real estate so even though he's not an industry professional he's not trying to sell you anything he doesn't have anything to sell you in the property game you know he's someone that we can all learn from um so maybe my first question jerry if you don't mind is like maybe just start from the start and tell us who this phil anderson guy is what is this cycle and why should we even be bothered by it at all yeah, that's a really good question because um, actually I think one thing probably to address first of all is that there's a perception or you know, even yourself referred to it as the Phil Anderson property cycle, right? Now, Phil Anderson is certainly one of like the leading experts and, and commentators on it, but uh, we should recognize that you know, Phil didn't invent the cycle. He wasn't <laughs> the first person to discover the cycle and he doesn't, yeah. he doesn't claim to be. And so, um, you know, a number of people and, and authors over the years have, have studied this, this concept of an 18 year real estate cycle. Um, and, and Phil Anderson himself is actually was inspired by a guy called Fred Harrison in the UK who studied it in the, uh, and he published a book in, in the 1980s. Um, and then Phil Anderson took that, ran with it and went back and studied over 200 years of history in the United States. Um, and so, yeah, whilst it's, Certainly, Phil is a you know a, a leading figure in the area. It's not necessarily the Phil Anderson cycle, as I would okay. refer to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Apologies. No, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, no worries. You don't have to apologize to me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so so there is this concept that um, there is you know I think people understand intuitively that markets do move in cycles. Uh, you know, markets move up, they move down, they move sideways, um, but. This concept comes from I guess, the background of looking at, you know, if you look at a long period of time, 150, 200 plus years, certainly in, in the United States, um, what appears to happen is that every 18 years or so, you get a peak in land speculation, um, followed by an economic downturn. And that's, that's sort of the, um, where this, this thesis or this economic a hypothesis has, has been formed and where, you know, there's a number of, of people who have studied it and have developed, you know, investment, um, you know, strategies and things around it. Does that make sense? So it's, so it's before talking about real estate, is it right in saying that first and foremost, it's actually uh, an economic cycle. It's just the booms and busts of um, how the economy goes up you know, and goes down based on fiscal and, and monetary stimulus and unemployment and all that kind of thing. It, it, is that kind of the root of where the theory yes, comes from? Sort of, sort of. But the, the I guess the, um, I'm trying to, trying to summarize it here because, you know, if it's called the 18-year property cycle, that's probably good marketing and it's short and it's sexy and it's punchy. But, you know, if you were to, to say what it really is, you know, you would probably be more appropriately called like uh, a study on the long waveform peaks of land speculation driven by a capitalization of credit against land values 
led by the US market or something like that, right? Like it's, it's a more sophisticated, it is a more sophisticated economic hypothesis and real estate is at the core of it, underlying land values and specifically how the credit system and the banking system interacts uh, with underlying land values. Right. Is that, is that more confusing or? or... <laughs> for, me, for me, it makes sense. And, yes. and maybe we'll get back to it in, in a yeah. second in terms of, you know, concepts like land speculation, which maybe sure. people, or maybe just to clarify for everyone, what do you mean by land speculation? Well, I, I mean, I guess speculation in land is the, the principle that, you know, you buy and hold land with the expectation that it will rise in value without uh, actually just by itself, without actually creating anything or developing it, just the land itself will rise in value. It's the same as speculation in anything else, whether you're speculating on Pokemon cards or Bitcoin or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, the speculation is the buying with the expectation that it will rise in value. With no further utility added. Right. Certainly, yeah. Sure, sure. And so economic cycles and land speculation cycles, now to hold that word, um, are a reality, whether it's in the US, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in developing countries here in Australia. To what extent is this 18-year cycle applicable in Australia? Like, is the cycle duration different okay. in different parts of the world yeah so so okay i think we can go into that but um and i've got some i've got some data that i can i think share with you and your yeah, audience please, to please. sort of show that but what might be a good place to start on um is just like an overview of what the cycle is and then what we can do is we can try and through that lens maybe see and try and interpret it within the australian market because uh, i think you touched on earlier that you know, it's not explicitly an Australian cycle. You know, it's led by the US as the world's biggest economy and, and you know, uh, the global reserve currency. But Australia does follow the cycle, but it manifests in different ways in different financial markets and different geographies. So that's, that's a really pertinent question. Um, can I share my screen with you here, PK? I've just got like a bit of a stylized... Go diagram. for it. Go for it, Jared. <coughs> okay. Now, hopefully you can see that. Um, now, this is from the public domain. I literally pulled this off Google Images, right? But this is a, uh, a bit of a stylized diagram of the 18-year property cycle. Uh, I just want to probably highlight that, look, this is uh, not to scale, right? It's, it's, a, it's a simplified <laughs> schematic just to give us a bit of a visual representation of it. Um, but what's important is that we can sort of break it down into four phases of the real estate cycle. And I'm just going to stop showing that so that it's not distracting from this point is that when you're looking back over like 150, 200 plus years, like uh, the cycles throughout those periods of time, like the economy and our lives and, and uh, society has changed significantly. Like we're going back to a period of time where people are literally getting around in horse and carts, right? So the banking sector and economy, it looks completely differently, but through a study of those cycles, what we're looking for is there are certain things that happen at certain stages in the cycle, which are the same. And that's kind of the underlying uh, metrics that you, you can look for to kind of tell the time of the cycle. Does right. that make sense? Makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to share this again. So yes, yeah, so there are basically four phases of the real estate cycle. So there's a first phase here, which is like the recovery or the first half of the cycle. We have a mid cycle slowdown. We have the second half of the real estate cycle or the, the boom phase followed by the downturn or, or the bust phase. So at different stages, different things happen. And if we think about like the first phase of the real estate cycle here, this is typically like after a GFC style event. So <laughs> if you think about uh, like 2012 onwards, mm -hmm. um, a number of things start to happen because the first thing that starts to happen and that you see in the first uh, half of the real estate cycle is that um, governments and policymakers and, um, uh, you know, and banks, they tend to put in place protectionary measures to make sure that nothing like this can ever happen again, right? So you get things like banking royal commissions, you get things like, um, was it uh, the the responsible lending laws being introduced, you get APRA interventions because the memory of the GFC is still pretty fresh. And so 
um, yeah, there's these things put in place in order to prevent that from happening. You think? Sure, sure, gotcha. Um, so then what happens is during the first phase, um, this is usually driven by new technology and innovation. And again, going back over 200 years, each cycle of the new technology and the innovation is different. Hmm. So, you know, through period, previous cycles, it was the invention of the, or the popularization of the, the steam engine and then, then uh, railroads and then uh, telegraphs. And then we've got computers and internet and blockchain and, you know, energy storage and all this exciting stuff. So the first half is characterized by that. And what we tend to get is about seven years of rising land values. Okay. Mm-hmm. Before we approach this um, mid cycle slowdown period in the market. Now, the mid cycle slowdown is typically where you get a stock market crash. But importantly, what differentiates it from the end of cycle is that this is not a land price led downturn. And so, because it's not a land price led downturn, um, you know, governments and policymakers and banks, they're able to manufacture our way through it with a relatively soft landing. Right. And so, in this period in the market, sometimes real estate goes down, sometimes it goes sideways and bumbles along, and sometimes it goes up. But it's importantly not a land price led downturn. And so, it's not, it doesn't tend to be a financial crisis. Right. So, the example mm-hmm. on this chart, and, and I know this chart's not necessarily to scale yeah. or anything, down the bottom, it says 2001. So right. the way to interpret this and, and connect it with what you've just said is that in 2001, there was not really a land price led downturn. There was the dot com bubble was burst. So it was a, you could say it was a financial downturn, but not a real estate downturn. Um, is that the right understanding? Um, well, I would call it a stock market crash, but the financial sector did not, banks didn't go under, you know, right. the financial, it wasn't a financial crisis in the same way that the GFC say, say it was a, it was a global gotcha. financial crisis. Gotcha. So that's correct. And, and look, recently we've, we've sort of been going through this. We've had a stock market crash through the, the Corona crash and, but real estate values around the world and in Australia have pretty much um, bumbled along a little bit and now have risen. And so that as well is, is one way it can be interpreted within the Australian uh, real estate sector. Because that, that's kind of always my beef with these types. You know, let me just play the devil's advocate for one second. Um, that's right. that's yeah. always my sort of beef with, um, you know, with cycles and, and saying that there will be a point where there's a recovery phase and then there will be a, a mid-cycle hiccup. And then, the, you know, my mind always says, well, like it's always different it's and this time it's different like this time um we've had this coronavirus led economic you could say downturn although it wasn't really a downturn you know because there was just so much stimulus pushed in and even though the stock market has crashed maybe three times in the last two years you know it's not really been like a 2001 crash um, because every time it crashes within a month, it's back up to where it was or, or beyond. And, and certainly house prices haven't come down at all. Um, so not only is there been no house price led crash, it's not even that because of a stock market crash that house prices have come down basically nowhere in the world in the last two years have, have house prices come down. Oh, could be wrong. There might be some random country, but um, do you know what I mean? So I'm like, my mind is always like, okay, well, it seems to fit the bill that there was a stock market rumble, but it was different this time because the housing yes. market wasn't affected. Like, how do you think about all that in the context of this theory? I mean, what you just said was uh, was a great way to summarize it. In, in, in the context of the cycle, uh, that sort of validates the, at least the theory a little bit. In the sense that in the mid-cycle slowdown, we do expect a stock market crash, but by definition, it is not a land price-led downturn. And, and also by definition, it's different every cycle. You know, the mm-hmm. dot-com bust is different to this one. And, and whilst you know, we're looking at this stylized diagram, which is very pretty, and like, wouldn't it be nice if markets moved exactly like that? But uh, no, they don't. And, and um, whilst what's, what's important about this cycle is that whilst you can expect, you know, a, a, a alarming regularity with which you can get the, you know, the peak to peak or trough to trough um, things happening, the frequency is pretty reliable, but the amplitude of the cycle 
it can change and it, and it depends on so many different factors and notwithstanding that you know the geography so different markets <coughs> you know some some global economies still haven't recovered from the gfc and you know and and australia was in a, a blessed position at that point in time being able to you know being a budget surplus and being able to just shovel money into the to the housing sector to kind of prevent that that downturn from happening but this the timing of it was was quite reliable which is why this is such a fascinating study right no i think that's a great answer that that makes a ton of sense um i hope so yeah okay okay i i think like everyone will want to know including me um where are we in this 18 and a bit year cycle like are we on that diagram i don't know if you want to bring it up again Yes. Um, well, well, hold on. Before I'm going to interrupt you because before okay, we get sorry, to that, sorry, we, we're, yeah, I'm we're getting halfway through. Yeah. You're getting excited, <laughs> mate. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, I'll sort of leave some clues already that, of where we are. But you know, okay. So where were we? We've gone through the the this pay, phase. We go through about seven years of rising land values. We have a bit of a hiccup here, and mm. then we enter this phase of the cycle, and this is the you know the second half or, or where the big boom happens. And whilst the first half of the real estate cycle is characterized by new technology and innovation, the second half tends to be driven by massive government spending in infrastructure, massive building projects, and that sort of thing. And the other thing that happens after the mid-cycle slowdown is because, you know, we're able to kind of manufacture our way through it. Uh, you know, recently we've seen this, how governments have stimulated the economy, a lot of QE happening and things like that. Um, we start to see an unraveling of the protectionary measures that were put in place after the last cycle. So, so this is also important because it allows the speculation and the run-up and the bust to happen for the next one. Because in Australia, we've had uh, you know the responsible lending laws, uh, the Banking Rule Commission out of the way. Everyone's forgotten about that. Um, we've had um, what else have APRA? They've basically come out and said that they're not going to touch the housing market anymore and not going to interfere with with the housing market. Um, and so already banks are starting to ease their, their uh, credit policies. And this is, this is very characteristic of, of the cycle itself, right? That's so, actually a great point because mm -hmm. just the other day, my mortgage broker was saying that even though interest rates are rising, a lot of the uh, levers that banks use um, to assess serviceability, they're starting to loosen them up, you know, things like looking at Precisely. bonus income and other things like that. So uh, what you're saying is, is ringing true for sure. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's in that way, you know, we can start to see that unfolding and, and setting us up for this second half of the real estate cycle at the moment. There's your first clue, PK, about where we are. <laughs> um, okay, so, so then uh, what tends to happen is, yep, we get another run up into the peak and, and typically the last couple of years of, of this run up, um, we start to see a lot of speculation. So it's no longer underpinned by fundamentals, everyone's piling in um, and, you know, and again, 2005, 2007, that's where there was all those fraudulent mortgage bonds in the United States and, and that cascaded through the world, we all know about that. Mm. we get the peak and a number of things happen at the peak and we can talk about indicators and how to tell the time if you like followed by the downturn of about four years from peak to crash to recovery so so that's that's sort of the overview of the cycle where you have basically 14 years up punctuated by a mid-cycle slowdown and then four years down roughly speaking right, right. is that a fairly good synopsis? I think so. Yeah, that okay. makes sense to me. So, okay, so now um, you, you asked a question about how it plays out within the real, Australian real estate sector. <coughs> and I know you have a background as um, uh, a stock market analyst or a... Uh, a yeah, I was an okay. um, investment banking, yeah, covering oil and gas stocks. Okay, so you might like this. So I've got here... Okay, so before, so I'm going to pull up a share market chart in a second, and, and this might show you how, you know, a good visualization or representation of how it might play out within the Australian market as well. But um, one, one important thing, just to kind of a principle, because I think most of your audience is uh, property investors, Correct. and they may not necessarily have like a technical analysis background or a share market background. But uh, I think just in principle, a key thing is that um, 
you know, and this is something that I've learned from Phil Anderson. You know, this is what he is, is very valuable at. His, uh, the way he looks at the markets is that a lot of the value in the share market is capitalized against real estate or land values. So uh, the financial sector, banks, depending on the bank, you might have 60 to 80% of their loan book is, is residential real estate. Mm-hmm. And even a lot of their business lending is capitalized against the, the balance sheet of the, of the business, which is the, the main asset is, might be the, the land value. Um, and, and then you have real estate investment trust, you have builders, you have developers. So a lot of the, um, you know, the, the share market is capitalized against real estate, which is why a land price downturn can, can cascade through everything and turn into a massive, massive downturn. Right, right. right. Which so, is what happened in 2007, eight. Correct. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again with that little uh, context. Now, this is an Australian stock called Stocklands. You probably mm-hmm. know the company. They're, they're a developer. Yep. And um, this period of time that I've pulled up here is from 1990 through to oh, 2010 or so. Mm-hmm. And it basically captures the entire previous real estate cycle, right? Mm-hmm. Now, that's quite a remarkable similarity. Yeah, it is. It's pretty right? uncanny, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing. So, um, you know, you can look at this and you can see that, okay, you know, um, the Stockland's a, a major developer in Australia, um, you know, trades in the underlying land value is capitalized into their share price. And so mm-hmm. you would expect to see this sort of shape. And you can see that from the previous cycle, yep, you sort of get about seven or eight years from the low of the previous cycle through to a peak, bit of a dip. And then after that, we go and break into new highs and we have a massive run up into 2007, followed by the downturn. Right. Now, okay, so this is only, only one um, stock. Uh, here's, the same, here's the same chart, but I've just extrapolated it so that we get from the previous cycle and then through to where we are today. Mm-hmm. And so, you, again, you can see that they're from the, from the top, 2007, to um, this point here, 2011 was a was the last uh, low mm-hmm. that was put in, and so that's a, a the four years down before the recovery. And then you can see again from there about seven years, seven eight years to the previous peak, we've had a stock market sell off, and now we're where we were expecting, you know, a recovery in this type of sector. Right. right. Um, I'm going to share another one with you because Stocklands, look, that's only one um, one company, right? And so, you know, I could have just picked that just to be persuasive. But the reason why that's a good one is because um, we can go back and we can actually look at the full previous cycle. Um, a lot of listed companies don't necessarily go back for the full cycle. So you just can look at, you know, parts of it. Um, but this one here, this is the um, SPDR uh, ASX 200 listed property fund. And so basically this, this is an index which tracks the Australian um, property sector on the share market. Sure. A lot of REITs, um, developers, builders, that sort of thing. And again, you can see the same, same shape unfolding here. And um, yeah, you can see the previous peak four years mm-hmm. down um, from 2011, 2012. We've had about seven years up, mid-cycle blip, and we're expecting now the next sort of recovery into the next phase of the cycle. It's very interesting that even though the real estate market has had a huge run up in the last couple of years, a more aggressive run up um, than even sort of up to 2007 mm. that these, the, the, these REITs and the stock market and the Stocklands, their, their, their price doesn't reflect it. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Uh, that's a really good point uh, because I think also, you know, we're talking about the difference between the residential real estate sector and then, you know, the REITs, and, and these sort of um, stocks are more, you know, probably skewed more towards the, um, the commercial side as well. Yeah. Um, and so a uh, little, little bit different, but again, for telling the time and seeing the overall shape. And this is why, again, you have to, there's different sides to the real estate sector as well. Just residential prices can move differently to other, other sectors in the market. Yeah. yeah. But since you, since you talked about residential prices, I've got one here for you. Okay, so this one is a chart from 
SQM. So this is um, an aggregation of the Australian residential sector going back to so 29, 2009, 2010. <clears throat> and again, you see from a bottom in, say, 2011, 2012, we have about seven years of rising land values, bit of a, a bumble along sideways through this period, followed by now the last 12 months where we've had a 30% growth year pretty much in Australia. And so mm. this would be an indication that we're entering that second, that second phase of the real estate cycle. Right, right. It's, it's hard to stomach. I mean, I know you're going to get to how we tell the time and, mm. and things like that in a second, but it's really interesting to me because what this is suggesting is that we've had, we've gone through that little hiccup period and now we're um, in earnest starting that second phase of the real estate sector, uh, sorry, real estate cycle. Yeah. It's hard to stomach it because we've already had such a run up. It, like you said, 30%. It's almost like everyone, in, including like a lot of people who, you know, not just no one's like they, they study yeah, this yeah, stuff yeah. as well. They, they think that the next year, the next two years is all about the property market coming down 20%, 30%, whatever, depends on who you talk to. But is what you're saying, and sorry, I might be putting the cart before the horse for a second again, um, but is what you're saying that we're really still early on in that second part of the real estate um, housing cycle? That's that's my expectation is that that's where we are, is we're just coming out of that um, mid-cycle slowdown. Now, again, what happens in the next 12 months or 24 months is less less significant than maybe what happens over the next five years, right? Hmm. So yeah, the next 12 months, maybe it'll bumble along sideways. D markets within markets, certain markets are going to go off, certain markets might come down a bit. Um, and that's that's also where you know your investment strategy becomes very important because you're not just buying an index or, or whatever, right? So when you're investing in real estate, so yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Um, was there any other cool charts that you wanted to share? And, and oh, talk mate, you're asking about charts. Yeah. I've got <laughs> sorted. Um, okay. So what were we talking about? We're talking, we're looking at uh, residential prices in, in Australia. Yeah. You um, took us through the SQM one and previous to that, you took us through um, the stock market indices to kind of, you know, further evidence where we are in a cycle. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, well, actually, no, you actually brought up a good point. Can I pivot this a little bit? Because, uh, you know, you said that, um, you know, there's a lot of people saying that, hey, the market's going to come off the boil now. We've had a 30% growth <coughs> here. And so therefore, you know, we're due to have a little bit of a, a correction. And, and maybe, but historically, that has not necessarily been the case. And usually when you have those uh, at this stage in the cycle, you can have a 30% growth year followed by, you know, several double digit growth years. Um, and so, you know, that that's happened historically as well. Um, and what's important for people to understand, I think, is people think, oh, well, house prices are so expensive. How can they go any higher? They just can't go any higher, right? But the, the housing market as a, as a big picture thing is not necessarily driven by, you know, what you and I can afford. It's more about, well, what, what can the bank, what will the banks give us? Hmm. And so, We've already seen the recent federal election. Um, both parties came to the table uh, promoting policies that are going to, you know, prop up the housing market. Um, so there are a couple of things that I'm looking for that may be a bit scary towards the peak and, and could drive it much higher. So, um, you know, bank assessment rates coming down, that could be one thing. So, you know, if, if banks were assessing loans at 2% higher than the interest rate you're paying, Three um, well, yeah. percent. Sorry, three percent. There you go. Yeah. Well, then interest rates can rise by one or two percent, but if the assessment rate drops by two percent, well, your borrowing capacity still rises in a rising interest rate environment. Mm. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, you know, the the government's now going to buy the house with you. They're going to pay thirty percent. Um, you know, the the liberal uh, party was bringing access to the super superannuation. So if you're allowed to access superannuation to pay a deposit. Um, that's something that's going to, again, funnel money into the real estate sector. Um, if, you know, lower deposits, deposits used to be 20%, now 10% is the standard, 5% loans exist, mm -hmm. single families can get a 2% deposit. Um, 
you know, if that becomes the norm, that could be a, a, another thing that drives it up. We've got you know, interest only loans for, uh, for owner occupiers could become common. Uh, it could have fractional ownership. Like there's so many things and, and clever financial instruments that could prop up to just, just drive things higher and higher. Um, not yeah. sa- that's not a prediction, but you know, these are the sort of things that I'm, I'm just sort of keeping an ear out for. No, it makes sense. And and one thing I wanted to ask you, because it's it's something that I haven't fully formed my um, own hypothesis on, but he- here it goes. You know, it's quite clear that housing affordability is pretty poor, like a- at least in, let's say, Melbourne, Sydney, you know, markets within markets, everything like that. But, you know, broad brush statement in Melbourne, Sydney, it's it's pretty poor. Even in Brisbane, it's getting pretty bad. And Hobart is pretty bad as well. Yet, in other countries around the world and other major cities around the world, affordability is just as bad, if not worse, but prices decade after decade, year after year have continued to go up. You know, everyone knows London, Hong Kong, New York, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my theory is that the property market no longer in these jurisdictions um, is no longer dictated by the average person. It's no longer the the median person or like the average person who's on an income of whatever the average is these days, $80,000, $90,000. It is not that person that dictates the direction of the overall housing market because we're we're living in a capitalistic um, society where you know those who depending on on how you see it work hard or work smarter or they just always had a leg up in life you know the the richer richer getting richer and inequality is getting bigger that's a that's a fact and so therefore there are more haves and those more haves are able to buy more real estate or anything for that matter and so therefore as long as there's enough haves as long as they the top 10 20 percent of society have enough wealth they're able to create enough demand to to further boost house prices that that's sort of how i think about places like new york think places like hong kong um london you know the average person in london can't buy a house so why is house prices still rising um is that what's your take on that is that why you think that um Sydney is so expensive and, and is not really cooling down. I mean, yes, house prices are going back a little bit, but it was so expensive five years ago. I remember after the last boom, 2016, people were like, yeah, damn, like no one can buy a property. <laughs> Next thing you know, yeah, five years yeah. later, it's like, you know, another 20, no, another 40, 50% up. Precisely, but, yeah. What, what's your, do you agree or, or do you have a different uh, view on my theory of, um, of how affordability is not the key factor of house prices. That's a really interesting point. Um, like this is also, necessarily... I'll just add one more thing as well. Yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off. And I don't have the chart in front of me right now, but when you look at um, wages mm. and you look at house prices going back 50 years, there's no correlation. Yeah, It's mm. not like when wages go up, house prices go up. You know, as a purport, you know, that ratio of house price to, to wages has just been going exponentially through the roof. And so that means it's not wages that provide cap on house prices at all. So sorry, I just wanted to round that off. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. I mean, there's a, that's, that's a whole other discussion topic on itself, but there's a couple of interesting things. Um, well, first of all, you named a number of like major international markets, New York, London, you know, uh, Hong Kong, Sydney, Auckland, yeah, yeah. The, these these are you know international hubs, and so they attract big international money. I think, and so probably more so than other markets. My my personal view is that those markets are not driven by the average person who lives in them. Mm. Um, but overall, um, I, I don't I don't know uh, how much that that statement is true across the overall market because those are, those are some pretty specific you know, international markets that attract international big money into those, into those places. Um, but again, we already sort of touched on that before that, you know, the, the housing market is what, what is driven is not by uh, what you and I can afford with our wages. It's what the bank will give us. Yes. And so if, if the bank will allow us to pay, um, you know, my parents bought a house when they first built their first home, the, the mortgage, uh, they had to pay a 20% deposit and the mortgage was over 15 or 20 years. Right now, if then your mortgage goes out to 30 years, 
the repayments are less, the interest rates come down, uh, the deposits come less, you can afford more again. And so I think the innovation of financial products and things to, to facilitate higher and higher prices is part of it. It's, it's probably a bigger part than wages, or certainly yeah. a bigger part than wages. Um, and then the other thing is just how, how much that cascades and how it like snowballs, because when you have a little bit of money injected into the bottom of the market at the you know, affordable end, let's say, then um, you know, we saw this in the last GFC when the government put in money in, in first homeowner grants and building stimulus packages. What happens? Well, the lower end of the market gets a bump. Um, that, the, the upgraders from there, they take that out. But let's say you have a 400K property that goes up to 450. Well, if you sell out and buy your next property, that 50K equity isn't just going to go into the next house. You're going to put it as a 10% deposit. You're going to leverage it up, right? And so the next tier up gets a bigger boost. And then the next tier up gets a bigger boost. And so it just sort of fans the flames and, and credit, credit just sort of grows and grows like this. That, that's my take on what you were just saying. I don't know if mm. that makes sense or if it's aligned with what your, your view is. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, um, and that's kind of a little bit similar to one thing that I had on my mind. And sorry, we'll, we'll come back to the cycle as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm just conscious of time as well. Is like how, <clears throat> in, in your mind, has this 18-year cycle phil anderson cycle has it changed post 1970s you know with the with the fiat currency um and debt you know becoming a big thing it, it's almost like the central banks especially post gfc have kind of discovered and discovered magic that we can solve any issues through you know quantitative easing we can solve any issues through printing money of course now we have an inflation problem um let's see how long that lasts well, i personally don't think it's going to last very long at all as soon as um supply chain bottlenecks and ukraine and things like mm -hmm. that are sorted i think it comes right back down um but does that uh, does that allow the cycle to you know just sustain itself longer and longer and is there then a harder fall or do you have any view on that? Yeah, so, so my understanding is that, um, you know, hi historically speaking, the cycle has, has been remarkably regular in terms of its frequency. You know, it's not exactly 18 years, but, you know, between 17 and 21 years, 18, about 18 years on average is, is remarkably uh, reliable. But the amplitude of the frequency is significantly variable and so all of these things i think fan the flames and could potentially we have to see how it plays out could potentially lead to bigger booms and bigger busts mm. um, um but you know if and at the moment we're seeing a lot of qe but like that might not be necessarily um possible at the end of cycle crash because if you have a if it's underpinned by a major land press downturn then you know, there might be currency issues and reasons why central banks can't just just keep pumping money into the uh, economy. So, um, without stimulating, you know, massive inflation, and so that's that's the primary role of central banks, right, is to preserve the currency. Mm. Um, and so that that could also be a factor at the end of cycle, as opposed to where we are at the moment, where they can just you know print more and more and more money to get us through where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Um, all right, Jared, was, was there anything else that, um, that you wanted to share about the, the cycle? Any other insights or any other pointers that you think uh, are interesting and people should know about? Um, well, one thing that I, I did want to share was probably just like a, an indicator that we can use to kind of time the top of the market. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's what it's all about. And, and then actually, the only thing we haven't really talked about, I'm not sure how you're going for time, but um, you know, in terms of actually investing, you know, we've talked about this cycle as a theory, but it's not necessarily an investment strategy, is it? You know, uh, so I don't know how much you want to go into that, or if we can leave that for another time. But um, I might just share my screen again if that's okay. For it. Um, because what I've got here is um, yield curve. Now, I'm sure you are familiar with this PK, but this is essentially. 
um, the US, the difference between the US uh, Treasury bonds between the 10 year bond and the three month bond. And this is going back to, you know, the 1980s. But what we're looking for here is that when there's an inversion of the yield curve, what tends to happen is uh, within sort of about six to 18 months afterwards, uh, we enter a recessionary period. And so we can see that that happened at the end of the 80s, followed by the 90s recession. Again, early 2000s, we had a yield curve inversion, followed by the dot-com bust and recession here. This inverted in 2006. So again, you could have been sort of forewarned ahead of the, the GFC um, style recession. And then again, we had in 2019, we had a yield curve inversion on this chart, um, which this is before coronavirus was in the public domain and a, a big, big news story, right? Hmm. So there was already uh, going to be, you could be on the lookout for something uh, to happen. Uh, of course, the yield curve doesn't necessarily tell you the difference between the mid-cycle and the end of cycle, but it's something to look out for as well as other indicators. You're looking in tops in, you know, REITs and developers and things like that. If they start to top out and then fall, then, you know, you, you, can, you can use those metrics to kind of see where we are and what's coming ahead. Gotcha. That was the only thing I also, other thing I really wanted to share with you. Yeah, no, that, that, that's very interesting because... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's impossible to perfectly time anything. And to kind of pick up that point that you were also referring to before, knowing about the, the cycle or any cycle is super interesting. And I think property investors owe it to themselves to get as educated as possible. Um, but like you were saying, this is not an investment strategy. It's not that we should be buying at a particular type of a part of the cycle and then selling at a particular part of the cycle. I mean, I always say that time in the market is very important. And I always say that timing the market is very important. A lot of people say time in the market is, you know, very important and timing the market. It's like, oh, whatevs. But I categorically disagree because you can time the market so bad that you will never buy real estate ever again. So timing yeah, yeah. is very, very important. But having said that, timing the market is not a strategy um, either because you can't do it perfectly um, every single time. And even within Australia, I mean, Jared, you know this as well as I do, um, and I want everyone to, to know this as well. Even though there's this cycle and it suggests that we're, start, we're still in this phase of, I don't know, maybe five, six years of continued growth before there's a huge fall or a fail or whatever there's going to be there's always markets within markets. Um, and so can macroeconomic commentary predict what's going to happen on one street in the south side of Brisbane or in one house on one cul-de-sac on yep. the north side of Perth? No, it can't. It can only talk aggregates, right? Just like when there's a recession, a lot of people become unemployed, but a lot of people also get pay rises. There's always exceptions to the to the rules. So it's a really good um, point that you made before, Jared, that none of this is an investment strategy, but rather it's more intel for you to be able to most um, intelligently implement your investment strategy. That That's the way I think about it. I, that I, love, I love the way you just said that. That's exactly the way I, I like to think about it is that, you know, you have the macro view, the big picture, the long wave form things and, and what's happening in the global global markets. Then you have the, the macro, the miso and the micro. And so uh, then as an investor, you, you increase your resolution of focus as you, dial in on not only the, the shorter time frames but also the uh the the specific geographical areas which you're investing in and so um i think this is the cycle this is the macro this is the big picture stuff then you got to look at yep the australian market and where that's at and what's happening at a, at a at a miso level in the middle and then you zoom really in and then you understand the individual suburbs and the geographical areas and which streets and what's happening and what's the supply and demand looking like and and, and different metrics at the, at the micro level. And I think, you know, you need to layer those together to be a sophisticated investor. And, and I think that's well, certainly what I aspire to do. Yeah. Yeah, no, same, same. And, and we were talking about this before we started hitting record, you know, if there's anyone 
um, who's a property guru, much like me, uh, who's saying, oh, well, we're starting at this cycle of huge gains in real estate you guys should buy. It's fantastic time to buy. Just switch off that video and unsubscribe because like that is not good advice. You know, we could be starting a cycle. We could be ending a cycle. There's always good opportunities in real estate. There's always bad opportunities to invest in real estate as well. At the end of the day, and this is my personal um, way that I find properties and, and and invest myself, I actually start bottom up. So, you know, you I like that um, example of like creating higher and higher resolution as you, you go closer yes, and closer. Yes. I like to start with the highest resolution, finding um, a really good pocket of a suburb that the data looks really incredible mm. for, and then zooming out and saying, oh, how, what, how does the overall suburb look? Like, is there any red flags that, okay, zoom out. Is there anything that seems a bit sus about that local government area and then the city, then the state? And it's like, oh, hang on, are we about to enter a war with China? Maybe I shouldn't invest. Or if there's no war with China, I'm going to go and, and invest in that one house and that one cul de sac. That's how I do it. Because if you go, this is completely different to what everyone else thinks and, and talks about. If you go top down, like how do you ultimately get to a location? You know, Queensland's a great place to invest. Is it? There's good places, bad places. Like, how do you make any intelligent decisions from that? That's just me. I pro I probably everyone's different, but um, but it's important to look at the macro. It's important to understand the cycles, but don't lose sight of what's important, which is just being able to buy that one house because that's all that you can buy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, anything else that that you wanted to to share and. Uh, I, I just want to thank you as well because you, you have a wealth of knowledge. But is there any other insights or anything else that you wanted to share lastly? No, mate, thanks. This, that's, I think that's quite a, we've covered quite a lot of ground in this. So uh, hopefully that's, that's of some, some use and, and provides a little bit of perspective maybe on, on it. I know uh, I'm getting the sense there's a lot of you know, increasing awareness of this concept of the 18-year cycle. But, um, and there are certainly, yeah, sophisticated investors who really understand this stuff and have sophisticated plans and, and strategies for, for trading it and investing in it. Um, but yeah, I think also there are people that just have a, maybe watched a YouTube video or read a blog post or something and, and it's pretty confusing. So um, maybe that's provided a little bit of perspective. Totally. It has for me. I've kind of learned a bit. So thank you for demystifying it. And um, Jared is oh, also... Hmm. Um, part of our facebook group so if you i'll post it there as well and if you have any follow-ups i'm would you be happy to sort of answer anything that if people have questions yeah i'll do my best yeah if people have questions and maybe drop them below the video or in the group and yeah happy to happy to talk this stuff i'm a bit of a geek so love talking property and cycles and all things like that yeah awesome all right well thank you so much i'm very grateful um jared i appreciate it a lot pleasure thanks pk Okay. Thank you everyone for watching. Hopefully you got a, a bunch of value from it. I know I did hit the subscribe button, turn notification bell on, give it a like. And yeah, once again, um, big, big kudos to, to Jared and, and thank you for being with us. Take care guys. Thanks,